that. Armored Core. <laughs> Armored Core is a lot of things. A million games, countless missions, landfills of mixed and matchable robot parts, billions in debt. On its face, it's a giant robot battling game. And that's exactly true, but it's not the whole story. The Dark Souls phenomenon is probably a useful framing device here. From Software was around long before their Breakout Souls games. You know that story, I know that story, but for real, FromSoft was always cool. Long before their sweeping financial successes, Lost Kingdom, Zatogi, weird niche games for weird niche people, for players who didn't feel represented by the funny jumping Italian, or the shrieking nacho chip, or the blue ball. And FromSoft's longest running series, tracing its roots all the way back to 97, was Armored Core, a real game for real adults. Where From's original series, Kingsfield, explored cropped environments in first person, Armored Core pulled the camera back, put the player in control of a mech tasked with completing merc jobs for big money to spend upgrading their screaming metal death trap. And that never really changes throughout the series, even. It's the core of Armored Core, and for an IP so long-standing, iterative, and surprisingly nuanced across generations, even within said generations, it's unfortunate how many people finally like the series, or from software at all, thanks to the latest game, Armored Core 6. So we're going back to the first, looking at every generation, not exhaustively, to highlight the value, show some appreciation, and talk about the series with an eye to its history. And finally, finally, take the mech pill. It's always this edible ain't shit, yeah. but real. Real. This edible ain't shit. Oh, playing Armored Core 1 in 2023 is weird because you say it and the room's like, what? What's up? Even today, the controls are fine. They're a bit to get a grip on, but it's nothing overly stressful. I'm an adult. The targeting box is big enough. You can upgrade it later. We'll live. Actually, Armored Core today is pretty surprising. It's a little stiff, but once you're in, plodding through zones and blasting enemies, it's fun. Feels fresh and almost modern even. Plenty of PlayStation titles didn't have the benefit of action combat. So many turn-based games, so many RPGs. RPGs, and I love them, but Armored Core is the game with the gull, busts out 3D environments to fly around, you know, Kirby with a gun. And mechanics, <laughs> aside from the immediate action that, for a low-budget PlayStation game, was a breath of fresh air, I really dug the whole experience as a video game. The PSX, again, is largely remembered for its long-winded classics with epic plots, cinematic framing, really pushing how video games could be perceived on limited 3D-capable hardware. Not always, but those certainly stick out in modern-day searches. You know, nobody's talking about Dragon Valor, but Armored Core says it straight. Game? or f off. You got a little circle menu, the shop, garage, mail, missions, it's sparse, dude. But that's because the gameplay is the selling point, right? That's where the budget is concentrated. So drink your game juice from concentrate. You pick up a mission and it goes by in a blink. Just shoot a few dudes and boom, mission complete. No lingering cutscenes, minimal dialogue on offer. I, <laughs> after playing all those RPGs, I'm getting a little emotional. <laughs> Armored Core 1 is almost impossible to argue with. If you pass the control filter and don't mind modest presentation, it's great. A fun thing to sit down and chip away at. There aren't that many missions. The game wraps in under four hours. And all the while, you're getting money for parts and upgrading your mech. Pimp your core, bro, yeah. It's a funny series. Lose a mission, sometimes it vanishes. Forever. God. God! Lose too much money from failures, mech repairs and ammo, you can unlock the effective easy mode, Human Plus. Now since I'm literally stronger than any gamer, and no you aren't stronger than me, I'm literally the strongest gamer and it isn't even close, that didn't happen. But Armored Core isn't inherently this hardcore win or leave series that some hyper fans make it out to be, at least not all the way through. It'll let you play, and that never really changes, generation over generation. 
please ignore third generation. Please. Armored Core is a little difficult to commentate meaningfully. The aesthetic is barren, but fits the setting fine. You gun through factories, warehouses, caves, and military bases. It's so dull by design that ACs, mechs, are suddenly hyper characteristic splashes of color in a world without. The music is sound, and you can hear it with your ears. Dear God. And again, story enhancers like cutscenes are so minimal that the second you see one, its value skyrockets through sheer rarity. Oh my God. It's the Desert Guy! The game suffers a bit from prototype syndrome. Parts are balanced very weirdly. Some missions are outright miserable and others are hilariously easy. You're never really guided towards building any particular way, which is good in a sense, but naturally leads younger people to picking up the next cool weapon instead of focusing on the less obviously impactful boosters and generators and FCSs, aka targeting reticle upgrades. So it's a bit of a bumpy progression for a newcomer players striking out in their own imperfect ways to reach the conclusion. But that isn't a huge problem when missions are kind of easy and you can resell basic parts immediately. You'll cue the clown music. You might get stuck playing through this extremely funny platforming segment, but that's just a skill issue, not design. It isn't questionable design. Armor Core was always perfect. Everything is perfect. Anyway, then AC1 slaps you upside the head with nine ball. Yeah, I really appreciate the fellow building right now. From big robots to bugs to even bigger robots, nothing's really a problem. Get filtered, slap on something different, done. Dusted. But Nine Ball is just over tuned, dude. And maybe he's fine, really, but the room he's fought in makes it such an obnoxious encounter by pure counter player construction. Your FCS cannot account for this room. God, it's hard to get excited about, you know, buy into the fandom mythology. Armored Core loves annoying bosses, though. Maybe to force players to get competent where the other gameplay challenges fail. And I mean, people will be mad if I don't, so. What is your wish? To develop a healthy relationship with the media I consume. Because I hate myself, I was compelled to play through most of the series, including most of the side games. This video is divided into generations because, for the most part, the design considerations that inform whatever game are linked to a broad generational vision, and the entries within whatever gen tend to allow both part and profile transfer in tandem from the preceding game and up. So Armored Core 1 transfers to the next game, Project Phantasma, and from there to Master of Arena. And from there, directly into my carpal ligament! It's important to pay attention to the side games or extra games, whatever you want to call them, because they tend to iterate in meaningful ways on the play established in whatever core entry. Take AC1. Game's fast and then done. Just like that, and I think that suits Armored Core well. It never gets bogged down with obscene challenges or annoying long segments, except for stupid nine ball and ammo is never really an issue. You you can't get exhausted by the fairly stiff controls when pick up and put down time is so short. Project Phantasma, however, got a little experimental. You know, as a joke. The missions were pretty tame in AC1, but someone had the brilliant idea of expanding them massively, at least relatively speaking. The end result is longer missions, but fewer overall. It creates some interesting issues. Here I am at facility entrance. Here I am in facility still. Here I am in facility room eight. When does it end? Oh, oh. Suddenly, ammo's a real big problem. It's common wisdom in early armor core to stick with an efficient energy weapon, but most of those have pitiful ammo counts and can't really justify themselves through some of these missions. They're just too long, or there's too many enemies. You end up getting really deliberate with your gun in a way you never would with a mere digital bill dangling over your head. Losing fake money sucks, but it's not a fail state. Losing and starting over? Because you physically cannot destroy your enemies? Because you lack the storage for extra ammo on your 200 ton mechanical war machine? That's pain. Real pain, like cooking a bad meal and everyone's eating it and nobody says anything. Or getting something sticky on your hands when you tie up the garbage bag and take it outside. You know it's never been more goddamn Jover, but 
you still gotta finish. I was warned that some games are balanced as though you've transferred your data, and while I don't think that's universally the case, you'd be hard pressed to actually run the first mission of Project Phantasma Raw between the insane amount of strays you take from shitty little gunner mechs, so I transferred and got set up with a new rig I'd never tried before. People often point out that the modularity is the fun, but this isn't custom robo where you're expected in the post game of that game to create five different robots in a single tourney and use them successfully. This, on the other hand, is a game where you get charged for failure and risk wasting time, and so I imagine most people find a good build and stick with it, like a marriage or a really good water bottle, and they call that a play style. That is, of course, because your chosen leg parts change up your play pretty significantly. Bipedal legs are basic, reverse joints are suited to aerial combat, tanks are big and slow, every newcomer sucks off quads like quads suck not me because they're like more mobile tank parts. Kind of fragile, still let you fire heavy back weapons without assuming the stance. So I did that. Oops, I found the win button. It's hard to get hype about Project Phantasma. Maybe picking up a DLC entry that tried new things was cool in 96, especially with all those parts you unlocked so you could screw around with impunity. But nowadays, long ass missions coming off the tightness that was Armored Core 1 mostly feel soul sucking. Objectives aren't clearly marked all the time. You can blow up the wrong guy in this convoy of cars, two of which must be destroyed to win. Like the changes present here for a newcomer can be summed up in a phrase that I already dropped fewer longer missions so maybe let's set that one aside and play Pete Kino core here Master of arenas like the mediocre white guy everyone praises for doing nothing except showing up to work and smiling Whoa! you dickhead except master of arenas actually good at its job. It's a great game, probably the best uh, or in competition with the original for greatest Gen 1 title, but it's built off the backs of two other entries, so it's hard to compliment directly. I mean, seriously, look at what Armored Core is. It's a badass game, especially for the PlayStation 1, but it's low budget and endlessly iterative, relying desperately on fan sales to justify making them at all, while simultaneously using fans as a long-term focus testing group. You know when someone gets you clothes for Christmas and they're the right size, but it's something, a style, a character that they think you should be and not what you think of yourself? I hate that sh It's almost grassroots game dev, especially since FromSoft published its own regional entries. Anyway, Master of Arena. Throughout the first gen, we've had the option of hitting up the arena, but there's never really a reason. It's cool, but also annoying, something you do for fun outside of progression, because mech battles are swingy and part dependent at times, but what that means is players have access to a bonus mode that can potentially go untouched. I barely took a dip, because because you only need so many clips of arena battles. Money is nice, but you never need it that bad. Funny combatant descriptions are nice, but that's just flavor and yeah. I need calories. Master of Arena does something smart. The devs decide that players are gonna play their Woo. game, and better yet, they're gonna tie it to the story. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. Armored Core stories are pretty blasé, nothing super intriguing outside of the context. To be crystal clear, I'm saying I think the implications of the stories are more interesting than the actual plot events, almost universally. That's because you never see characters, things don't really get screen time, they're not fleshed out, they barely take advantage of the medium, and when they do, it's so so limited. A 20 second cutscene, some text boxes, whatever with that. And yet, Armored Core does something many Nintendo games, for example, don't have the balls to do. Outwardly critiquing corporations with political power all the way back in 95. Mostly of note is the use of the word corporation. You could argue the word was simply pulled out as a designating word, but that's a pretty boring angle of analysis. But it has specific implications in many countries and economies that take its use beyond the simple designation of a manufacturing company. Corporations and companies are different things. Corporations maintain a veil of legal protection that companies don't have because corporations are groups of people, shareholders who 
deposit money into this distinct legal entity. So one individual shareholder is not responsible for whatever corporation's misdeeds the corporation is, which is not true in the case of a company which exists under some individual's name. In short, a bunch of people with money and interests collectively protect themselves under the corporate umbrella. You can see how that might create some issues if not appropriately legislated against. For a brief and simplified political lesson, in North America at least, corporations can lobby the government, that is, legally attempt to influence policy decisions, and generally speaking, by greasing the wheels with a lot of money. So, for example, maybe Exxon hands a political party a pile of cash to stop any potential or meaningful legislation meant to tax or regulate that corporation's main product. And they can opt not to sponsor said party if said party goes against their moneyed interests. Depending on how corrupt the institutions that be are, you can see how lobbying could be easily and readily abused at the expense of the people and the future of a nation? Lobbying should be illegal because it directly privileges entities with significant capital over the electorate, the regular human beings who make up the voter base in a democracy. But money! A crucial part of any bog-standard critique of capitalism includes a critique of corporations writ large. And with some of the things the game makes you do, it's not hard to read that out of the games. The actual political situation in Armored Core is a little different. Humankind lives underground because of a cataclysmic event. Basically, they're oppressed by circumstance, and corporations vie for direct control over what remains by hiring ravens, mercenary AC pilots, to do the dirty work. It's understood that ravens live to die, more or less. The corporations leave work to these pilots because they will act extrajudicially and, whether because the in-universe government or whatever enforcement apparatus is so thinly stretched they won't investigate the very obvious money trails Ravens leave behind, or because FromSoft didn't think about it very hard. Ravens generally live to fight, just like the player wants to play the game. And Armored Core opted, back then, to critique corporations in this manner. One of the first things you do, at the behest of a corporation, is quote, eliminate squatters. The mission text implies that these squatters are actually protesters against redevelopment in the local area, but legally, the corporation cannot assault them. So you're made, as a mercenary, to Holy snuff them out. You do a lot of snuffing out, killing protesters, wrecking cities, expanding the influence of whatever corporation you choose to work with across the various titles, doing things that can only be described as profoundly evil. And Armored Core places this story, this context, into a game about blasting through missions for cash to make a cooler robot. That's the story I like, the one that critiques corporations alongside the materialistic player unwilling to read between the lines, or the player who acts complicit with these orders until they eventually break free by the end, often by choosing the correct path. You could argue it's tacky in the way that The Last of Us having players kill a dog only for the owner to cry out, shaming the player for unnecessary game action. But isn't it true that even merely mentioning politics forces comment sections to immediately populate with game for the game, not for the politics, disliked? Armored Core is really unbelievably loud on this particular topic, trots it out without fail in every generation, and I respect the hell out of that. Master of Arena has the player unable to enter the arena, then offered a sponsorship by a corporation. Missions eventually trickle out and you're made to run through the arena bums, learning a whole lot about how bad you actually are in the process before missions open up again. And missions open up specifically when the corporation revokes your arena license license to focus on their interests. Oh no, someone didn't read the fine print. I love that. The corporations are insidious, but often because they hire out, pull strings, manipulate. Master of Arena makes their villainy very obvious, personal. The player knows immediately they're being deployed for someone else's game. You don't question your missions, you do them. And when you eventually overstep by taking on missions external to the corporation, your contact lets you go. It's gutting in a way you wouldn't expect from text or from one of these games. They'll cut you loose and leave you to die, regardless of your history together. Anyhow, Master of Arena forces you to fight Nine Ball, 
and then two nine balls, and then a super ultra nine ball. You think you're funny, don't you? So here's me winning. Wow, gamer moments. This is so gamer. Can I be gamer now? The second generation, Armored Core 2, is easily the hardest to commentate meaningfully. Plenty of mechanical minutia is tweaked, and visually, I mean. The game left a generation. It's exactly what you'd expect. Minus dual analog support. Now, the thing still uses the archaic trigger aiming and does deep into Gen 3. Okay, hey, FromSoft? Why, though? It's that special kind of leap, crossing a whole console gen, the kind of thing that might have lit up a hardened fan's grizzled face, darkened by the nine-ball generation. But the game feels almost identical. Smoother animations and visuals notwithstanding, you're still piloting a sh** heap you pulled out of the junkyard, and missions are still over in a handful of minutes. So... So anyway... And... Armored co Okay, knock it the f*** off! Oh. Armored Core 2 is a little more to handle out of the gate. The fundamentals are basically on par with the first game, only sometimes you get stunlocked by regular MTs. Silly me, or you run out of ammo, and you're forced into the garage early, and you pick up the machine gun with a thousand shots for most of the game. Sure, no problem. I went to armored school, I got my diploma. Well, let's take a minute to talk about the play we left out, since this is AC1, 2, and all. Armored Core hands the player a lot of options. Whole movement styles via the leg parts, a wealth of weaponry, shotguns, snipers, rifles, back-mounted cannons, and missile launchers of various kinds, some of which require hunching in place to fire unless you've got quad or tank legs. You have options, but playstyle is rarely accounted for in the campaign, and many missions are low requirement. In many cases, a single weapon can easily dismantle the entire game. Like the energy rifle I used in 1, the sniper rifle I used in 2, the Gatling guns I used in 4 answer, etc. If you find the most efficient weapon, sometimes purely by accident, you never need to engage. On top of that, you can zoom through the main game ignoring enemies a lot of the time across many of these games because you're decentivized from engaging. Firing only costs money, same with taking any damage, unless you're explicitly made to clean house in whatever mission. And while you might think, that sounds like bad design, the way you're explaining it, I have two points. Build diversity in a game this varied can have drawbacks. Some ACs just aren't reaching the finish line in some missions, particularly with platforming challenges. They're not all built to accommodate the player. But many missions, and especially the first half or two-thirds of the game or so, are freeform and low requirement, not forcing the player to engage with trash mobs, not demanding a speedy clear. So build diversity is allowed to flourish regardless in a game with fairly tight mechanics and punishing game play, at least for someone less apt with a controller. So if you like your stupid pet project, you can have it. For the most part. The second point is, uh, whether by pure accident or secretly genius narrative design, Armored Core incentivizing conservation of ammo, preservation of AC, picking battles wisely, all feeds into the mercenary vibe of the game. You're there at wherever to do your mission and leave. Not to dick around, not to skirt skirt on them enemies, and definitely not to drop a stank Fortnite dance on the burning wreck of an enemy mech. Pull up, pull out. That's what it means to be a raven. That's why I'm proud to announce I grew a brain and drew the line at Armored Core 2 Another Age. Now I know it hurts to hear. Old school AC fan, I know times were hard 20 years ago when you had nothing to eat but Armored Core. But every time I asked people which ones I should play, I got a litany of entries or just all. And man, you do not need to play every single game to get the gist of this series. I play just about every other Armored Core entry, but then I saw the second Gen 2 game had 50 mandatory missions required to roll credits and thought, you know what? This is just a prettier first-gen game with mechanical differences so minute as to exclusively matter to high-level players who don't need a goddamn review in the first place. Pull up, pull out. That's what it means to be a YouTuber. Check, please. One fun quirk of the levels in Generation 2 and on is really needing to mind your space. You can just leave the arena without meaning to aborting the mission. 
I sh oh, shut up! No, I didn't! Armored Core games can be tough to start if you aren't confident about resales and get stuck early, but the arena tends to be an option. I'm proud to say I played exactly two arena matches and realized the entire concept is cheesable because the AI is stupid. And maybe that's actually incredible design. The arena is annoying, and so is lots of Armored Core, so why should I have to play fair? Nineball didn't, FromSoft. This is what happens. AC1 had hidden parts, and I'm glad to say most of the games do. The titles are bare bones at a glance, but you gotta remember that A, this isn't AAA, and B, the budget's mostly wrapped up with mechs. They picked the thing they cared about and catered to it. Drop little secrets in levels to fill out your garage. Boom, fandom. Go figure. I don't know much about mecha, Gundam, Gunpla, whatever, but if I had to guess, I'd say mech people like customizable robots. That really is the joy of the play, outside of, you know, piloting them successfully. I will say, build diversity does suffer slightly in this game. They added new optional parts. They added a radiator part. They added new mechanics like overboost. And yet these things don't impact play over much. Minus overboost if you're really fixing to be good at the game. Otherwise, it's pretty easy to get exhausted playing these games hour over hour. There are a lot to take in at once, and you never know when you'll hit the next stank mission. Progression can be bumpy, and Armored Core doesn't do a lot with its context, its individual stories, to keep players going. At least early on. This second game does step it up compared to the first generation. It introduces a mentor figure in the tutorial stage. This guy Strung, it's a little high strung, has the player uncover a series of mysterious entities wreaking havoc in various places, and the player is ultimately betrayed by the mentor. This comes after clearing out a number of MTs, and the guy just starts blasting. It's jarring, being made to act outside of regulations and expectations. It's weird, considering the, what, 10, 12 missions that came before, but I guess that means it's secretly brilliant because it shook me up when I wasn't just following orders anymore. Change the thumbnail and title. The secret brilliance of Armored Core. Betrayals happen in Armored Core, almost always because the player threatens the status quo by being the biggest gamer, and I think that really speaks to a lot of gamers. That's basically the series in a nutshell. Horrible living situations for humans, whether due to a cataclysms or apocalypses, nuclear war, corporations rise up and seize control with military might, only it's contested amongst multiple corps. That or an AI government is in place and the corps play around it. The player insert character is so successful at the merc business he's eventually deemed dangerous and either escapes, seizes control, or is disposed of. The world is broken. You did or didn't leave your mark. In Armored Core 2 specifically, you fight with another Raven, Leos Klein who holds the title Ninebreaker, making him the arena champion and thus, potentially, the raven from Master of Arena, the player. It's a cool callback, but exactly what you'd expect for a game promising nothing more than PS2 Armored Core. It's exactly what some people wanted, but not particularly visionary. Thankfully, Gen 3 really had it all. Armored Core Generation 3, the hardest core armored core narration. Calling all gamers, your balls are in jeopardy. People really like Gen 3, and for some pretty clear reasons. It's the penultimate armored core experience before things got a little weird. It's the confluence of every design decision, every tweak and alteration, every experiment from the first game on. Pick it up and play. If you've done either preceding generation, you'll be right at home. This set of games happens to be the most expansive, with four major entries, arguably even more depending on what side games you're counting. So it's kind of a big deal. I played almost every title. The base game, The Silent Line, Nexus, The Last Raven, but Dodge Ninebreaker because fans pretty unanimously agree that it's not worth playing and, you know, four's enough. It's just enough. If you can't get a picture of third gen without the ultimate comprehensive experience, you probably have traces of OCD and should seek medical counsel. Not in the comments section, dirtbag. The series finally gets dual analog support, like modern controls, partway through Generation 3, but we wouldn't see any kind of truly modern control scheme until fourth generation. 
I managed to ignore the option in every third gen game. Needless to say, it barely factors into the third gen, so I'm not going to mention it. AC3 feels like any other game at first. Loading in, running missions, building up, taking names, stacking paper, buying parts, getting stuck for two hours on the final boss. Live, love, laugh all the way through. War never changes. But it's gotta be that way. Every generation needs a core experience, and the Armored Core formula was good. It got people collecting robot parts and maybe even using them. Combine that with a fairly playable game, and you can do whatever you like in the side titles. And I know somebody is upset, somewhere, that I'm not really being thorough, detailing every design change game over game, thus far, talking about the stories which are basically the same, game over game, so you know what? Let's do it. Let's talk minutia because it can add up. Maybe a list of tiny factoids is appropriate for video review after all. Let's, Let's go! The shop is now in the garage, saving you time alongside the ability to sell parts directly from the assembly screen. Simple descriptors explain every stat on a part so you can finally understand what any of your part's specs mean. Kind of, whatever 367 energy drain means hover legs from Gen 2 actually get mission support. Heat, a stat that affected AC since the second generation is more of a consideration now, especially in AC on AC battles. Sound effects are different. You can drop weapons, but I didn't know that till late in the game because there's no tutorialization. You can finally equip more weapons to the offhand instead of just crap. Wow, that was riveting, wasn't it? Let's play more Armored Core. Naturally, it's stuffed with things we've seen since the originals. Factories, underground cities, all teeming with MTs and regulars and ACs sometimes. Occasionally, you'll fight a boss with mechanics, if you can call them that. I don't know if temporary invincibility really counts, and the eventual insufferably difficult encounter coupled with a betrayal. Love to see it, except fighting two ACs kind of blows and the developers know it. You're led into a mission with a partner who turns on you, but critically, the devs allow the player to, upon failure, because how would you know otherwise, to preemptively gun down your would-be attacker. And that felt pretty good, knowing someone years ago thought, hey, Hey, maybe fighting two at once sucks, actually. <laughs> that was something I noticed about the second game. AC battles, regardless of the number of actual combatants, were excessively anticlimactic because they simply didn't have actual health pools. The player was cut a break all through the game, and while the marathoner in me loves that quirk of two specifically, three was a massive step up in difficulty for any AC fight because they were fair fights, all things considered. Minus the traitor thing. Having enemy ACs act like equal enemy players makes them memorable. They become legendary, storied enemies, something like initiation for newcomers, and it affords these ACs the dignity Armored Core as a franchise tends to deny its pilots. As we know, pilots' faces are never shown. People are totally dehumanized by this setup, which makes it very difficult to sell character. So when the insanely challenging, specifically painted and equipped mech starts taunting you through gunfire, some kind of actual bond is formed. Like developing a parasocial relationship with your favorite YouTuber. Any characterization will do, but you've got to do it. You must put some stank on that. Mamma mia! Video games thrive on character. One ally you pair up with will turn on you if you so much as tap her with a bullet. And that's really annoying in the middle of a firefight, but it's the kind of thing you sigh at, shrug, and move on. Another memorable experience. No game is simply the level design or the mechanics. It's not a formula. Armored Core is solid, but Spice sells it. I appreciate those whiffs, those notes. I'm getting quite the earthy tone from this one. On that note, please, no more blowing up giant computers housing the AI that controls the setting. No more of that. That's exactly the opposite of what I was just cheering for. Bring back the characters. Bring back the weird. Now, I don't want to devolve into reviewing every one of Gen 3's titles. The Silent Line is quite literally just more AC3. It does have these cool maps though. Okay, okay. Game's hard in plenty of places, and it's got 198 additional parts. Reskin, sure, but choices, man, choice! And like always, I'm sticking to one build unless it gets blown up. Mm. 
I do think it's interesting how much FromSoft got away with. Nowadays, this would be labeled corporate greed or an insult or something. This should be DLC, etc. But really, it's more Armored Core. And who else was making a competent, perpetually supported mecha action game? Nobody. That's who. And if the price to develop more Armored Core is something that might as well have come on a second disc in the same package, well, I guess that's how it has to be. But reviewers at the time weren't having it. Even Famitsu dropped its score three points from AC3 before it because no matter how you look at it, the actual product is more or less unchanged. Dull visuals repeated, archaic control scheme untouched, gameplay that looks basically identical to AC3. Are you watching this video right now, bro? Did you know we're talking about the silent line and not AC3? While some of the greatest games ever made were absolutely crushing the competition, FromSoft continued with conservative iteration, and you can probably understand why, if that's what needed to be done to stay afloat. Like any reviewer going, well, Sly Cooper is uh, looking really good this gen, and frankly, this just looks bad by comparison. Two points off. Shouldn't be talking about video games. But ignore that. So, with mounting pressure to advance, a lot of the same praise mixed with a lot of the same sharp words, FromSoft comes out with Nexus. What the f*** am I looking at? Nexus had a totally different look, totally new controls I totally didn't bother engaging with because the old ones are still there and I didn't go looking. And they're really not all that bad anyway. And it's pretty goddamn weird to play after all these samey entries. Nexus looks at the feedback and says, fine, then hands you basically armor core again anyway, because the play is the play is the play until fourth gen. It features a branching story that reacts to which corporation you back, as always, but also accounts for your successes and failures, meaning things can go in all kinds of directions. One thing that works real good like is the inclusion of short character characteristic cutscene moments. Early on, this black AC skates in, whirls around, and leaves. But it's so interesting as someone who hasn't ever really cared about mecha. You have to demonstrate the beauty of the thing, yeah? Like having a leaping from a horse onto a moving train scene in a western. You gotta prop up the charisma of the giant robot, and Nexus brings it every few missions. Actually, a lot of the experience sucks regardless. Customization is limited because heat is a serious threat now. Overheating drains your energy, and overheating is exceedingly easy without incredibly good radiators, which happen to be incredibly heavy, so you're forced into playing extraordinarily carefully with light builds, or big, slow, and ugly with heavy builds, and all of the requirements to make your AC function how it should massively strains what weapons you can equip. Tons of weapons lack for ammo or damage, and it really feels like a blanket nerf on player capability coming off previous games. Nexus is wild. You're looking at the tipping point for Armored Core, the game before The Last Raven, a spiritual death for the franchise. And what happens in the story? Really traditional Armored Core business. Corporations fighting over uncovered ancient technology, snuffing out workers, labeled terrorists, all the stuff we've already seen before. Oh no, not you again. And it has the balls to whip out Nine Ball as a final boss. Like, remember old Armored Core? Wave goodbye to old Armored Core, it's going away. You trash him and get annihilated for becoming too powerful as usual. Something that was foreshadowed earlier when a corporation you were hired by for a mission fired on you instead. It's a fascinating moment if only because none of this is new literally, but contextually symbolically and in the face of Armored Core's history denotes the end of an era. And for good measure, it slaps a ton of old missions on a side disc for nostalgic fans who want to get a grip on new AC controls in old places. It really is a love letter to diehards. How can you be pissed if you don't like anything, the old thing is there again, but new. Like as a consolation prize, it's beautiful. Incidentally, Nexus didn't perform all that well relative to the rest of the series. Sort of an I told you so moment, as though changing the controls wasn't going to change anything about how the series was perceived. And I agree with that. I like modern controls, but let me tell you, people are so quick to blame controls over their own failures. Enough that that stupid f meme about holding a controller backwards to optimally pilot your AC in old Armored Core games persists today. Do a learning day, bro. Play around. 
turn it off, come back, teach yourself to fail and persist, it'll be okay. Drink your orange juice, take a step, and then another. Overcome! You have to so fight I'm yeah. so fing tired. The last raven can shove its head up its own ass. What a f fun video game. Really cool game here. We've got slightly longer cutscenes featuring the colorful AC posse. That's what I'm talking about. We've got a fully rendered garage that transitions into the missions. Nice touch. We've got short, snappy, challenging missions. That's exactly what I think I asked for. Oh cool, new mail. Oh my god. Also, the game is uh, impossible. Just truly unfathomable. Misery. You can lose parts in this game, or at least have them damaged. First time in the series, y'all! Take too much damage? Too much compromised structural integrity? Buy it again, idiot! <laughs> the entire thing from top to bottom is hostile to the player. It's competing for your earnings. It's deliberately not letting you progress at times and serving up the most demented missions so far, and it isn't close. Getting too close to an exploding enemy is damage. For the first time ever, this one early AC battle features two MTs that take a hell of a beating, and he's easily gonna be stronger than you early on unless you know what you're doing. The guide vid online features a guy playing with really cheap parts, but he scrapes by with raw skill, a level of input mastery that I could only ever aspire to. Thankfully, I had transfer parts, but man, Man, that's just one of them. Maybe it just put me in a bad mood, but wow. How about this mission where you blast down an AC that just won't die, only for another to pop out? Oh my god, I can't take this anymore. This game is such a struggle. Look at this long player whose vids I watched, and also thank you, he didn't like it. But why? I guess because Armored Core was historically challenging in places, but never out of the gate. You get about one mission into Last Raven before things get funny, and for a game that has an economy, suddenly getting punitive about it feels very weird. In a way, I have to respect the vision. Armored Core rested on its laurels for so long, and to finally take it in a psychotic direction is kind of impressive. It's certainly memorable, more than most, but not in any way casually enjoyable. It's a very short game, but a very short game you fail through many times. Its story structure is also worth mentioning for that reason. Unlike previous titles, Last Raven branches off significantly. Here's a visual in case you're curious. Treat any mission you complete like an episode, so you go from one to another and down the list until you've finished the game. So many permutations, so many paths, I can see this title being significantly more enjoyable. If you happen to stumble onto the easier missions first and get into the hardcore stuff later, like tackling Mega Man Zero 4 before playing the older ones, but sitting at the tail end of a generation. There's really no better way to go out. You can't just do AC3 again or repackage, that's all been done. To be super clear, none of the third gen games are truly unfathomably unbeatable or miserable or whatever. Not really. Any Armor Core game breaks under some kind of specific pressure. For example, in Nexus, I found I could just hang back and assume the stance and fire laser cannon blasts until the enemy died. Their AI isn't really good at dodging, they just approach to die. One thing about third gen, parts are reused across games, models, maps, often sounds. This series constantly recycled itself up until fourth gen, and sometimes a video game player, perhaps a gamer if you will, will call that laziness from the developer. Devs reuse things not out of laziness, but out of budgetary demands and deadlines. And if I have to hear that word uttered again at FromSoft, a studio that was constantly fighting for market relevance and money, oh my god, so please, pipe down. To make it snappy, The Last Raven is important for similar reasons to Dark Souls 3 and Elden Ring in relation to Dark Souls, showing off how tight exactly encounter design can get before the thread snaps. Difficulty is something you design for. You could theoretically give a Goomba fireballs to match Mario's. You could give it a damaging aura that made it only stompable safely every few seconds or so, and tighten the window that would allow you to safely squash the Goomba. But at a 
point, it gets frustrating and tiresome in a way that makes the game unpalatable. The Last Raven pulls the thread so taut, I can only see people with the most time to waste, the fewest responsibilities, the least vacuum departments really going to war for its honor. It's not for everyone, and even thoroughly bumped me until I went back after every other game to give it another shot. It's probably one of the best in the series for exactly 500 people. Leave a like or comment if you wish to feel represented as one of the 500 Last Raven enjoyers. A couple portable entries exist that normally I wouldn't cover, but I think they're left out unfairly. Not because they're the most insanely underrated Armored Core games, you know, but for the implications they have for the universe. Just take a look at the setting, a future where ACs are mass-produced and such a common feature of daily life that they're repurposed for sport. In this case, operated by pilots remotely in bloodless combat, just big old machines whacking each other. The gameplay is just that. You build up a series of ACs and battle it out with every enemy who gets in your way. Rank upward, bot by bot, tweak and perfect your ACs with every loss. Every enemy is a unique build and you're made to demonstrate your mastery of armored core systems, part matchups, etc. You don't even have to battle yourself. You can let the computer take over in case you're bored or don't want to bother doing the math by hand to solve whatever gameplay equation. It's not a particularly easy game. I was shocked how quickly enemy ACs dismantled my jank builds because I didn't consider how parts interacted. If customization is the joy of Armored Core, it's pretty weird to turn that joy into a job, into something you have to consistently get right. I think that's a fine formula to suck the fun out of the freeform play. Armored Core was never so consistently hard as to demand and specific playstyles and parts. But, critique aside, none of that is why I care about these games. It's the aesthetic that does it for me. Armored Core is grim, miserable, it highlights the relative weakness of humankind in the face of changing times and never bothers to dignify them with portraits. Just puny, faceless models occasionally seen in some games. The world is dying, humans are f- Whoa, come check out the Armored Core Grand Prix, sponsored by Sony, NyQuil, Burger King. Like, the sheer weight of corporate coombs slicking up every inch of this title is blinding coming off the previous games. And that's kind of the point. In a war-torn world so thoroughly browbeaten by corporate conflict via mass-produced mobile super weapons, people need a distraction, and it's just the legal repurposing of ACs. Who said they all needed ravens to pilot them and missions to complete? Why not just throw them in the ring and turn a profit? The Grand Prix is run by the corporations who produce the parts. It's a simple way to spread brand recognition, perform field tests of newly developed parts, potentially humiliate the competition. I may have taken the piss out of Armored Core earlier by implying the stories don't ever really change until the late late titles, going as far as repurposing the same elements a la Bioshock Infinite. There's always a corporation. There's always a player character. But Armored Core is also firmly committed to the story it wants to tell, to the vision it's trying to capture. Even in these silly spin-off titles, corporations are still shuffling parts and turning a profit, and this time cynically on actual weapons of mass destruction. To call Armored Core's stories simplistic is one thing, but you absolutely cannot write off the intentions behind the work. The lengths from Soft will go to paint the world it's rendering. Generations 4 and 5 share this funny little quirk. You might know it, the uh... Wow, dev expenses for 7th gen games are really, really high. Here's one main title in the highly recycled expansion pack slash sequel that goes for a sold uncle on eBay. It's an understandable problem to have, but weird coming off Armor Core main entry, Armor Core Mewtwo Strikes Back, Armored Core Next, Armored Core and the Giant Peach, Armored Core ass. Changing times. War never changes. War has changed. It makes these gens weird to commentate because the follow-ups are always treated as the definitive games of that gen, you know, Daniel and the cooler Daniel, with the establishing titles treated like dry runs because that's what they are. Prototypes, experiments, before the eventual refinement. Moving from Armored Core 4 to For Answer, named thusly because people pray to God for answer. 
Oh, brother. We see massive part rebalancing, plenty of retooled bits from the previous dev cycle, and reworked mechanics and gameplay in case anything made the original stink up store shelves. So you gotta play them both. And Gen 4 is even more important in the broader history because it's the first time Miyazaki directed an Armored Core title. Hidetaka Miyazaki is a person whose name you should know by now as the ceaseless discharger of souls, but in case you don't, he worked with FromSoft from 2004 on, planning The Last Raven, meaning I can personally blame him for ruining my September. Oh, joy! He then directed Armored Core 4 in 2006, 4 Answer in 2008, and eventually Demon Souls in 2009. So it's not like he killed Armored Core. He directed some of the most enjoyable titles. They control normal. They run at buttery frame rates depending on the platform. They let you chain dashes into one another by dashing, inputting a direction, dashing again, ad nauseum so you can schmoove on anyone. Well, that'll do it either half. I wasn't talking about you. Armored Core 4 is set in an alternate timeline, a clean slate if you will, with all the same old dressing. Devastated planet, governments replaced with corporations, conflicts between said corporations. But this is next gen, so the pilot is a Lynx and not a Raven. And Lynxes are people who pilot the advanced Armored Core next. It's one of the smoothest runs in the franchise. You can rip right out of the gate with your basic mech and have fun, zipping around huge open 3D spaces, luxuriating in the fully modern control scheme, dual analog bliss, and shoot everything that enters your targeting reticle. You get beat, you power up. And I learned the hard way, but if any mission is too annoying, or too confusing, or just too weird, you can skip it. No problem at all. The game's cut up into chapters with a set list of missions to complete, but you can run them in whatever order, and you only need about three quarters of whatever chapter's missions finished to advance. That was super helpful because this obnoxious submarine mission just, after a number of tries, did not make sense to me. The protection target would die long before I could get around the map and blow up all the subs, which were launching missiles that I could hardly take down fast enough. So I skipped it. Sorry gamers, I officially don't understand Armored Core 4 now. Even earlier, there's a drone blasting mission I kept running out of ammo on, and again, no engagement, no engagement. That's part of the joy of Armored Core. You know, what mission's gonna blow right by? What mission is gonna give me a full strength titty twister? How about this mission? Okay, see, this is exactly why I love Armored Core. Load into the mission, someone's cutting the door in the tiny room you're in, enemy mech starts blasting, and then it's done! It's in a matter of moments, just reduced to an explosive pile of scrap. Peak gaming? I think Armored Core is great when the player can customize their experience from mech colors to how the game progresses at all. There aren't any failed a mission and it disappears moments like some of the older games, but that's good as well. It sucked when you almost beat something and instead caught a bill only for the thing to vanish, like getting coal in your stocking for trying. Armored Core 4 doesn't offer much by the way of novelty regarding general mission structure. It's just about what you played before, but the vibe is completely different. The Armored Core Next name might be slightly cringy, but it's not a misnomer. Gameplay is fast, frenetic, and fun. It absolutely drips with charisma because instead of piloting a 40,000 pound Omega Chonk, you can practically teleport if you're chain dashing. It's so much fun to play, it's hard to criticize meaningfully. Isn't this what Armored Core players wanted? I think there's an argument that no, it's not, but it's gotta be coming from old heads. AC1 to The Last Raven is a proper f lineage of games, more iteration than most series ever get. So to tell fans, here's new Armored Core, and it's fun, but also basically insane, is definitely gonna cause a light schism. And there isn't much on offer outside of the core experience. Its greatest weakness is its simplicity, its sleekness. The other AC games, most of them anyway, packed in bonus content, optional allies you could select during the sortie screen. Let's see, we've got Huntress, Scylla, 
Apple Boy! <laughs> Secret parts to uncover and winding progression paths you had to uncover yourself alongside a hefty investment into the old control scheme. There wasn't necessarily a ton more to the old armored core, but it was textured. Something like a satisfying sandpaper, scraping away the cruft, smoothing out the edges, creates an experience I can only describe as fun! but could barely tell you a thing about the run, other than that it was easy. In the spirit of fairness, this isn't an AC1 to AC2 situation. It's a leap in console generations, but it's using a whole new set of mechanics as well, and on a system much more expensive to develop for. It's a successful gamble, arguably bringing Armored Core to a wider audience while retaining the joy. That said, I think the gameplay kind of speaks for itself. I'm minimally invested into AC4, just running it raw for the first time here, but it's a lot of flashing lights and moving pieces and it's over in a blink. Even the final boss, this mutant AC, goes down with a little backwards kiting. In the hard mode, another AC will pop in soon after, but even still, it's a game that passes in a blink. You can't meaningfully upgrade your mech, you know, tune it just right. All of that if you're never really made to interact deeply with the systems, if the game is too accommodating. Suddenly the challenge of old Armored Core, the difficulty coupled with the systemic grit, makes sense. For answer is FromSoft's answer to that problem. The follow-up fourth gen sort of sequel is harder, path-driven, shorter, but longer in some. It demands a lot more of the player, but with its heightened demands, creates something memorable. I've talked about it before, but one of the great difficulties in designing games with a mind to perfection, making them these ideal, smooth experiences, necessitates that peaks fall and valleys rise, and a quick, no-trouble play isn't memorable. For a series that's catered to fans of the mecha genre by offering countless iterative entries and top-of-the-line takes on mech combat, memorable should stand right alongside fun in any entry. So, the campaign is expanded with three slightly shorter routes than the one present in 4. Corporations are actually worth mentioning here. In the older games, you picked what corp you wanted to work with by taking their missions whenever you were given the option. A couple might pop up and you could advance this or that corporation's interests, almost all of which were bad regardless. Do you want the Union Busting Corp or the Child Slave Labor Corp? 4 here lets you pick your route off the hop. I like that actually, it simplifies the process, makes it less messy, though also it stops the inherent drama of pulling out and swapping sides a la The Last Raven, something I thought that game actually did well. It also means you need to play the thing three times to get the full picture, and that's just beautifully insidious design. I aspire to that level of cunning, vile stuff, and while I call the game harder, because it is, some missions don't even approach issue status and simply go down. Take this one where you're blasted into the combat zone and have to dismantle a gigantic tower. How am I gonna do that? So at the end of your boost, you fly all the way up and land in the top compartment and break it from the inside and you win. Like jumping over a whole hordes of enemies in Xenoblade X or any other certified eating gamer moment, just being allowed to ruin the entire design of a mission by being really greedy is such a memorable payoff for the player. It also packs challenge in spades. AC battles range from pathetically easy to exceedingly difficult in this series, usually because some fold to AI abuse and others just don't fight fair. Anytime the game throws two at once at the player, for example, but players love talking about white glint. Armored Core 4 is the first AC game with any kind of proper dodge. In this case, a quick boost that jerks you in whatever direction. White Glint happens to abuse dodges more than any AC I can remember, leading to a fight that resembles a Halo 3 Wi-Fi match circa 2008, complete with rubber banding and simulated object impermanence. I got him on my first try, but barely. It was pure luck. I found missions were tighter overall, not begging for a specific build as much as a specific strategy, like moving behind this battleship to avoid total annihilation, or being made to equip parts efficient at demolishing immobile targets, specifically to avoid your inevitable death by a thousand bullets as you dance around whatever superstructure trying to break its supports. One thing I'm embarrassed to admit is my choice of build. In most Armored Core games, because I was roadrunning it to hit the finish line ASAP, I found something
something that worked and stuck with it. That's probably pretty unusual for fans getting into the games who want to, you know, try things. I still think the system doesn't incentivize it nearly well enough. Who among us hasn't bought a shiny new gun only to realize it actually totally sucks and that we should have tested it before running the mission? In both games, I slapped a pair of guns on the thing and never changed, unless I had to, and that's not even optimal. Plenty of missions love melee weapons, but once I found my comfort zone, that was it. I experimented with handheld missile launchers and had a blast literally drowning enemies in explosions, but saved that setup for tough AC fights. It needs to be said that every Armored Core game basically lets you get away with any build you like. You have to learn, you have to try, you have to craft it yourself and put it to work. But a lot of the time it's very easy not to bother. It's very easy to find the solution, solve the equation. And there is some kind of tension created in that. You have these garages full of parts that you will probably never actually use. There's never an incentive to build multiple ACs unless you really just feel compelled to stock up on loadouts. I guess what that means is Armored Core is a game that you get out what you put into the series. So let's talk a bit about stories in this gen. 4 shows us an Earth undergoing a population boom that puts pressure on resources like food and energy. Wages stagnate, causing a pay gap between the wealthy and poor, not unlike the lived reality of the human species in 2023, and civilian unrest threatens to topple governments. Damn, this is the most hopeful I think I've seen Armored Core's universe. Naturally, because Armored Core, corporations rise up with private militaries, depose the world's governments, and rule the land, fighting for territory influence, etc., all via ravens. Old news. The entirety of Force plot can be reduced to micro-conflicts that result in the player gaining reputation, toppling corporations, causing further instability, almost being assassinated, and walking. It's about as bog-standard as it gets for Armored Core retreads old tropes. How about four answer? The state of the world has degenerated, nothing was effectively accomplished, and the surface of the planet is contaminated with toxins called Kojima particles, which of course were weaponized through Armored Core Next models, meaning the decay of the planet is largely the fault of corporations seeking power through ravens or lynxes. Oh, and some people live in floating living spaces while the poor are consigned to breathe in toxins until they die. Thank you for your continued condemnation of power, capital holders, and the human species. Four Answer has three endings, one of which ends in the presumed eventual death of all human life thanks to Kojima particles reaching the sky. One which destroys the floating cities but allows humankind to access space in the future, something that was previously restricted by setting bullshit. Uh, a decent ending. And a final ending where you just kill everybody and rule over the burning trash pile. I find FromSoft doesn't like making direct or definitive statements with their work. The world is, in effect, a canvas for the player to make decisions about, but what's notable is the abject Ooh, pessimism informing the endings. You can leave things to rot, leave Earth behind, or light it on fire. It's hard to say, what a riveting tale about a vision of Earth edging on misery porn, but to the writer's credit, it's not wrong about the species. People who position themselves to rule, those who seek power, are absolutely the last people who can be trusted to do the right thing in any situation, okay? They're the people who will punch down because they know they'll survive the consequences. If anything, Kindness and fostering community are evolutionarily beneficial, strategic human behaviors, and absolutely not the rules by which the movers and shakers play the game of being alive. In summary, spot on humankind dunk, but let's get a new story, huh? If I have anything truly bad to say about Armored Core 4, it's simply that old fans have a point. This is awesome and slick and cool, but it does make you wonder what the goal of Armored Core is, like as a game. If you can pick up a gun and go, what's the challenge? What's the draw? If you're never sufficiently challenged beyond like, move a little bit that way to win, or target enemies better, or dodge a little faster, what's left to invest in? Builds, maybe, but even that's reducible to aesthetics and numbers. The stories are fairly barren, and the controls really don't demand any kind of mastery for completion's sake. I made it through. PvP might be a good avenue then for a simplified or smoothed over armored core, but in this era, Wi-Fi just ain't cutting it, at least outside of Japan. Well, 
As it happens, Gen 4 was left as a footnote, a passing fancy, kind of like the game itself. No other game plays quite like it, excepting arguably Armored Core 6, and that's after working systemic cruft back into the systems. It's a beautiful, tight experience I could never call bad. I like it better than basically the rest of the franchise, to be clear. It's the one I'd like to go back to first. But I can see the nuance and the struggle for a modern Armored Core identity. Gen 5 is that struggle made manifest. Oh, that's a chonky boy. That's an Owo Hemkin Chonkor. That's a BBM, son. Big, beautiful mech. Let's go! Where the first three generations felt largely similar, taken in broad strokes, and established the Armored Core identity very thoroughly, and Armored Core 4 got into the coke, 5 did away with everything. Sure, it kept the bare fundamentals, it's a mission-based, customizable mech battling game, but also hit up the JC Penny, got a shave and a haircut, really changed things up. <laughs> what is that, speed stick? It was broadly maligned by a subset of old heads, and for understandable reasons, but that has very little to do with the game now. First, good luck getting a copy. You might snag Armored Core 5 for a fair price, but it pales in comparison to the expanded release. Verdict day, just like for answer before it. And those prices are steep. Yuck. Thank you, scalpers and speculative investors. Second, good luck emulating this thing. You need a special version with a special setup I'm not at liberty to talk about. The benefit is, with a beefy PC and some Googling, you can get the fifth generation of Armored Core games running at far, far better frame rates than the original hardware releases, and truly buttery FPS with mech textures disabled. Unfortunately, the thing crashes like every 20 minutes or so, and I can't recommend the time investment to most people. It's a real catch-22 because AC5 truly runs like jittery f oh! garbage on original hardware. Violently disgusting frame drops, not unplayable, but man! And the solution is a massively improved version that just sucks to gun through. Ah. I've heard the Armored Core 5 Discord as a better setup made for multiplayer, which is still being played today by some very dedicated fans. But I don't want to be social. Sorry. I'll lay it out plain. I've never been into mechs. In mecha media, the person behind the thing is subsumed into the robot. You can still easily convey character in all kinds of ways, from movements to techniques to weapons to paint jobs, but immediately, at a glance, I didn't get it. I wasn't pulled in. Big robot in bold font is simply not enough for mech poo poo or k -bash. Armored Core 5 mech pilled me. And it's all in the mechanical implications of the aesthetics. Let me explain. In the old games, mechs were weighty. Obviously, they were slow and heavy, they plummeted out of the air and turned on the world's largest dime, but they could fly, sometimes forever. You could play some of those levels like a Kirby game. And 4 was, again, Whoa! It's like arthritis for your eyes! But 5 slowed things down. While controls maintained modernization, so it feels good to physically handle, with simplified boost mechanics and extremely generous auto-aim, the actual mech you pilot has genuine heft in a way I don't think the older titles ever captured as well. You can't fly straight upwards, you can only jump and kick off the walls for additional height. You're constrained by the physical reality of the levels you navigate through. Like it or not, you're playing an Owo oh, Hemkin Chonkor. And I can see that being frustrating for longtime players looking to schmoove on their enemies, but there's still plenty of room for fancy movement alongside tactical use of buildings as cover, which you're always sliding through. It's a unique vibe that isn't captured anywhere else in the series. So, where did the changes come from? Armored Core 5 was built specifically for online multiplayer games. That was the big directional shift. That was the identity they decided on. Armored Core 1 to 3 was the foundation. AC4 was a wild action title, but 5. 5 is for the internet. They probably didn't want players zipping around on trash Wi Fi, rubber banding, teleporting with impunity. Hence, these more tactical spaces, these more limited mechs, and this incredibly large targeting radical coupled with surreal aim assist. 
But that's not the end of the changes. Suddenly, part counts lower. It's a whole new generation, after all. You need to level yourself up, basically by grinding missions to open up the store. And that's across both Gen 5 titles. And plenty of the game is permanently gone now for most people playing today because online access is no longer officially supported and the best parts, or higher level versions of basic parts, required going online and engaging in digital part commerce between players. And now, and now it's, it's gone. gone! For anyone into video games, the whole of the experience is pretty insipid. It's incredibly short-sighted to lock out huge swaths of in-game content, part upgrades for Whoa! f*** sake, behind a mode of play that is no longer supported. Gen 5 is very much a product of its era, the shining example of what sucks most about the seventh console generation, with its games-as-service fixation and endless multiplayer concessions. In almost every way, Armored Core 5 should be my least favorite gen, but it isn't. And really, it's the chunk. That's it. Armored Core 5 and Verdict Day take place in the aftermath of Gen 4, a world in ruins with practically nothing to fight over, but soldiers, mercenaries, and warhounds clash over the scraps, whether for themselves, war's sake, or at the behest of some moneyed individual. Nothing new there. You get a little more character out of the NPCs, people with lives and opinions and mannerisms. It's much more uh, quirked up than your typical Armored Core fare, but I think that's fine for a one-off generational change. Doesn't matter how annoying these people are, eventually someone's gonna die. ACs in this age are chunky for a reason. Most are cobbled together from workable parts and scrap. They're not the cutting edge weapons they once were. That Boom! got a plate on its leg, what? Just listen to these absolute mechanical soundscapes. Hear the chunk. Incredible. Oh, oh, it's a symphony. Oh wait, no, turn it back, put it back, turn it off! Uh, let me level with you. Armored Core isn't like pots and pans down the stairwell annoying. It's like I'm talking right in your ear. Annoying. It's unhinged. You've got to play it to believe it. Whether it's your mech tromping all over the damn place, gunfire and explosions, or your inbuilt comm system shrieking at you for every little f Whoa! thing. It's a game you play on lower volume or adjusted audio otherwise. But then Armored Core always hated the player's ears. Okay, I have got to touch the volume controls. So how's play otherwise? Slow and methodical AC control is coupled in the first fifth gen game with lengthy story missions and garages. You'll run through one leg of the quest, refuel, repair, re-equip if you like, and head out to complete the rest of the mission. This is good in theory, letting the player restock for the first time in the series. Mid-mission, it's pretty wildly forgiving, but it also exists to stop players from running long-ass missions in slow-ass ACs from the beginning in case you're stuck. And it doesn't always pan out that way. More than once in a main story mission, I found myself horribly equipped for the next part of the quest but either died in combat or ran out of ammo and flailed around like a dumbass, unable to actually advance, forcing a restart anyway. That admittedly shouldn't have happened. Unlike past generations, weapon arm parts, like picking arm guns instead of just arms, isn't the same thing here, and you have access to bay units that don't immediately make your AC overweight, meaning you can carry four weapons at a time or one pair alongside weapon arms. You can carry an armory. Armored Core 5 is isn't incredibly challenging, but it's possible to not have unlocked good enough parts to challenge whatever part of the game. Or at least I felt that way. And so you go and dig around in the side missions. Both games throw piles of optional missions on the player. They're mostly destroy all enemies or destroy target AC, and they're a decent barometer for player power. Every mission is a difficulty rank and that'll help you track where the game thinks you are Anyhow, I got a lot of mileage out of different weapons in 5. It was fun to play around with sniper cannons in a build that didn't really warrant it at all, and sling any old weapon into the extra slot. Having multiple options, multiple damage types, is key to some missions, and that kind of strategizing feels fun unless you hit a wall. But main missions will have a garage anyway. So damage. The only thing that matters. Damage was, historically, something you upgraded with better weapons because whatever you started with sucked, and not always. I got by on that old shotgun and sniper in the early games, and they were basic. AC5 changed up the formula, rock, paper, scissors style. Now weapons deal kinetic, chemical, and thermal damage, and it's probably done like that to create something resembling balance in online games. 
After all, if there's always a check, always a go-to counter, it's hard to really level meaningful complaints about overtuned parts. Just equip more kinetic damage gear. Oh, it's still borked? Okay, we'll do a blanket nerf of 5%, that kind of thing. This means some missions are miserable unless you swap at a garage mid-mission, because whatever boss will be resistant to your build. The benefit is, you can stock up with 4 weapons total via arm and reserve slots, but you can also hit an autosave point before a major boss, forcing you to quit out of a mission anyway, erasing half the presumed purpose of the garage, to restock for mission utility. It's clumsy, but it's a consequence of designing for multi player. The stories are very short, 10 main missions per, and at least in AC5, force you into battle with weird boss enemies, kind of like the occasional giant MT you'd fight in earlier generations, and they're pretty brutal at times. Building for speed is definitely an asset here, but that also puts you in conflict with how much you can carry and the weapons you can equip. It's why melee is so strong in solo play. Those weapons tend to be light, but tack on serious damage, and let you dismantle anything other than a quick moving enemy enemy AC that can take a hit. 5 wasn't special enough on its own, however. Verdict Day, the sequel, steals its thunder massively, and mostly by undercutting 5's experimental stuff and returning to form. Long missions suck, man. They didn't work great in Project Phantasma compared to the first anyway, and they especially don't work in a slow-paced game. AC5, in truth, isn't any slower than the original titles. You feel heavier, but you still coast along the ground and dash just fine. Flight is restricted, but encounters aren't unnecessarily prolonged or anything. Still, it tends to feel slower paced, likely because of the sheer amount of stuff you're made to maneuver through and around. The fact that, really, no matter how much you want to climb up to that vantage point, you probably can't. Verdict Day brings it right back to the good stuff. Missions are brisk, you pull up, do the task, pull out, just like the old days. Doing a side mission, it's probably a quick roundup of some enemy groups or one of the many, many, many AC battle missions that basically function like an arena. There's no need to level up or fill out the garage. You unlock new parts via story progression, and the campaign is just as short as before, with fewer junk missions cluttering your playtime. It wanted players wrapping the campaign, arming up, and getting online. No real barriers and little wasted time. Servers were killed shortly after, but from what I understand, Armored Core 5's multiplayer was fast and fun, with plenty of room for technical movement and, again, reduced teleport potential with reasonably limited movement. AC5 is sometimes dunked on for its lack of technicality. The fact that, really, nothing about the mechanical experience is very difficult. The pace of the game, as compared to 4, feels something like sticking Bloodborne footage beside gameplay for Neo. And worse, nothing about 5 is challenging to input, really. A sin for the hardcore gamer, except for maintaining energy efficiency. So in Gen 5, you have access to Scan Mode, which turns things blue and lets you scan enemy weaknesses and see enemies behind walls if you send out a probe. Energy recharges extremely quickly in scan mode, so you're incentivized, per the combat's basic rules, unless you've already built some hyper-efficient monster machine, to constantly swap in and out to regain the most energy mid-combat. You turn off weapon access entering scan mode, so you do have to work and be quick shifting gears to make it efficient. I think it's just the right amount of challenge and complexity for the series. It's already juggling a lot from multiple resource management to slippery positioning, but please leave a thesis in the comments about why Armored Core 5 needed to be Armored Core whatever other game. I mentioned feeling guilty about my minimal engagement with builds. Wherever I could get it, over 15 some games, I relied on advice when I could because it's a lot to get into sometimes. The idea of tuning parts back in Gen 3 made me too nauseous to engage any further. I like the big parts, but tuning how they actually work was a bigger ask than I expected. It's a lot of numbers and no guarantee that touching it actually pays off. And when I finally did engage with tuning of my own volition, it was for evil. So all throughout the series, I favored reverse joint legs unless I needed to protect myself. I liked flying around. I liked learning the mechanics of the old games. I liked the appearance, and I tend to really dislike slow, heavy builds. That said, I got filtered very quickly in Armored Core 5 by the constant AC battles. I tried a lot of different things. One of them for forced me, no word of a lie, to hang just outside of its optimal range which would cause it to change weapons, temporarily disabling 
enemy fire and rode that AI abuse to a close victory. But it got worse. Enemies were tough, main missions were too populated by enemies, I wasn't dealing enough damage. So I folded. I went for the heaviest tank I could buy. I even went from Gatling guns, a favorite from Gen 4, to auto cannons, basically super Gatling guns that require treads to fire without holding still. For a good chunk, I slotted up no less than two shields, one in hand and one on my back in case the first broke, and gunned down every AC I could find like a dog. This ridiculous, high damage, high defense, highly immobile build carried almost the entire game from the third story mission on. It obliterated whole squadrons and laid utter f waste to the many ACs I fought unless they specifically defended extremely well against kinetic damage. And there were two of them. Nothing really stood a chance. And it felt dirty the whole way, like I'd given up on my main legs for an easy ride, like I was cheating the game. I didn't even rely on recommendations, I just figured it'd work. And it did. Until Black Glint, anyway. Actually, I've seen people use my build on this boss with no problems, but it's such a brutal fight. He can kill you in a single hit. He riddles you with bullets and missiles. It sucks. No other way to describe it. They put a boss that would've fit in 4 into the slower 5. Why? Whatever, it's a big last battle at the end of a generation. The way Armored Core 5 saluted its longtime players like, oh, you think our game is for boo Die! By the way, super weapons exist that I didn't really bother with, but look at this chainsaw. You could kill a person with that thing. Like eight of them. So you know. Bring it on! I don't think the 5th gen really gets credit for its HUD. Arguably it's a lot worse than I'm thinking, because the numbers are tiny and sitting back in a couch with a fatty, you know, the ideal way to play these games. I feel like you'd lose a lot of info that was clearly visible before. Ammo counts, etc. But they knew the game was as fast as old Armored Core to actually play, that people would be facing off in multiplayer arenas and getting flanked, circled, etc. So they must have wanted everything front and center, right? Cramped together, and in this case alongside the FCS, the targeting radical, meaning the game is truly always in front of you. It's a lot more enjoyable to play up close, I guess, but look at all the space you get. We can take in these levels. Maneuvering through city streets and alleyways isn't a problem when you can always make informed decisions about your place in the world, thanks to relocated real estate. I like it. So, five gens in. What have we learned with writing? There's one big corporation led by a character called Father. The world is a mercenary ridden hellscape because war has changed. There are goofy side characters. So absolutely nothing, huh? War has remained exactly the same for like 20 years. Verdict day. Hit me. What's the verdict? Well, after the quote, event of the previous game, verdict day is about a war over mysterious towers while a bunch of edgelords watch from the sidelines and get involved to handpick the player for potential group candidacy for their immense skill, also called playing the game. And there's some traitor sh because like Stephen King, is more inventive with his tropes, man. You can, but you shouldn't just decide, that's it, that's all there is, for Armored Core. Up until this game, very little about the series has ever deviated from its fundamentals, and story least of all. Maybe it's that nobody in the studio wanted to change things. Maybe it's that nobody saw a vision for Armored Core that expanded past those predetermined boundaries. Clearly the games are willing to show a cutscene and highlight a character, but never a person only names and actions, and occasionally personality. For a long time, Verdict Day was the last Armored Core entry. You gotta remember that. Locked away on the PS3 and Xbox 360, doomed to jittery frame rates and eventually price gouging douchebags. All while Dark Souls flourished, raked in a billion smackers while old heads, respectfully, didn't appreciate the state of their fading dynasty. How could FromSoft forget about them? The punchline is a decade passes, 10 goddamn years. So what did all that Dark Souls money buy? Damn, I can't believe Armored Core 6 is the Dark Souls of Armored Core. Really early in my uh, journey through Armored Core, I watched a lot of long play videos. Like, I kept them open as I ran through the games because I like seeing how far I am when I'm doing an actual goddamn marathon. The Armored Core 1 long play featured every played mission sorted by chapter, hence stop Dark Souls and bracketed by the LPer, if only. 
It's important that new fans understand that piece of context. Armored Core old heads sometimes have a bit of a sh relationship with Dark Souls, almost like how SMT heads sometimes absolutely despise Persona. Both Persona and Dark Souls represent a studio, making Omega Bucks and more or less leaving the old franchise in the dust to pursue the bag, shifting priorities. As for where I stand, I mean, this is my first pass at the series, but I've already played more Armored Core games than most Armored Core fans, and I gotta tell you, I see both sides here. Let's lay the groundwork. Armored Core 6 is an extravagant, triple-A mech-blasting masterpiece. There's really no room to argue. To dunk Armored Core 6 is to ignore a wealth of build options, a goddamn feast of animation, of the mech action game concept brought convincingly to full-threaded present-day 3D opulence. The sights, the sounds, the kinetic verve of the play. To dunk AC6 is to ignore the entire lineage of Armored Core and what it taught the developers about their own series. To demand more old armored core is to beg a corpse to dance. But to go at the game from that angle, the this is the greatest game ever angle, is really, really boring. <laughs> to suck wholeheartedly from the teat of Armored Core 6 is also to, in some small way, close the door on the past games. I'll take the more positive route here regardless, I think it's gonna be okay, but I'd like to entertain a little nuance. AC6 tips its hat to fans in the intro, forcing them to outdamage a highly armed chopper boss and, well, the internet didn't like that very much. I enjoy that some people got filtered by the fight, not because I like players getting filtered necessarily or telling people to get good. I'm not a complete f idiot, but rather because Armored Core was always tough and rarely truly f annoying. This fight isn't all that bad. You're just new and poorly equipped. And it's good of them to rope old fans back in like, hey buddy, dad's back from the corner store. 10 years later, what follows is maybe the final form of Armored Core design. This is a series that's lingered for nearly 25 years, been through countless iterations, focus testing sessions, right, undergone metamorphosis, and final finally got handed a budget. So what does that mean for gameplay? It's a thoroughly modern control scheme, just like AC4 or 5. Very little obstructs player handling. You have all the options you'd expect from dashing to jumping, boosting, overboosting, and it flows together more beautifully than ever. AC6 isn't as jerky or blindingly fast as AC4. It's paced in a very pleasing way, no arguments, and it's still fundamentally armored core. It's a game about mechs, so prioritize the mechs. Play is at the forefront. You run through a series of missions ranging from throwaway nothing sorties to full-blooded epics. You'll load in, skate around the countryside like it's Tony Hawk, I guess, clear out the entire enemy contingent or a couple targets, easy A, simple as. Or you'll be led into battle against a target you can't see, duck laser fire from a distant cannon, pull into range, and realize the mission isn't just avoiding fire, but toppling an absolute skyscraper of a mech by disabling its movement, breaking a leg, scaling the entire length of the mobile fortress, smashing specific targets on its body while avoiding laser fire yet again, and finally dismantling the cannon before getting out and watching the fireworks. Actually, the game never really tops this moment. It tries with scripted explosion after explosion, the occasionally cool guy moan trademark. I won't miss. Oh my god, dude. Keep it in your pants. And I don't want to say that the game never really tops this moment. It does plenty of peaky things throughout the experience. There's one moment where you're entirely stripped of everything you've built, everything you've come to learn to use, and made to crawl your way out of an area teeming with enemies with this scrap, this piece of junk. And one of my favorites, having played the older games, is rolling into a battlefield that's already been swept and coming face to face with an actual honest to God raven, you know, who you're LARPing as. I love that. Progression is fairly slow to start, and I can say that having cleared New Game Plus like everyone else. It's got me feeling some kind of way. I struggled through a few missions or took a couple shots at more than a few during my first run, and personally, I don't think I got any better between playthroughs. Not really. So what's up? 
You're made to power up, not just by acquiring newer, stronger parts a la most of the later Armored Core games, but by grinding up stat boosts. Nani the fuck? Arena play was always weird. It's been anything from totally optional to absolutely mandatory for progression, and in this case, Arena is basically mandatory, but in the soft sense, you don't have to engage with that type of content, as long as you don't think you need 15% damage and damage reduction, better health packs, etc. I like it because, frankly, if something's worth including in your game, it's probably worth incentivizing engagement, and these battles take, what, a minute each? Get you experimenting with different weapons and even builds if you hit a wall? It's an elegant little solution, reward play with easier play. Love that, but what that means is, once you've done your arena battles and upgraded your mech and unlocked the parts you want, you can clear almost anything in the game with ease because the difficulty was largely numbers as opposed to skill. I'm not sure what I'm even complaining about here. Skill is such a nebulous concept, but let's follow it down the rabbit hole. Armored Core, like as a series, has an interesting relationship with difficulty. Some people prop it up like it's some staple of the franchise, when that isn't true almost at all. Armored Core 1 is fine, minus 9 balls, same with most of Gen 1 outside of boss fights, Gen 2, Gen 3 outside of the truly f egregious Last Raven, AC4, most of Verdict Day, it's not the hardest series. They're great for, if you're that type of person, smoking fat doinks, sinking into the couch, and blasting because it's fun. When Armored Core is difficult, generally speaking, it's because of numbers. Because in most generations, dodging meaningfully isn't an option. Those boosts don't have iframes, so dodging incoming fire is more a game of mitigation than pure avoidance, at least for most players. You can optimize damage reduction by mastering AC movement, knowing when to rise, fall, strafe, and overboost. However, unless you're in a truly lightweight, agile mech, you're taking some fire, so outgun and outmaneuver, but this isn't Dark Souls. Most people aren't getting perfect runs here. And that's true of AC6, whether it's incoming fire from off-screen, stray shots from a Gatling gun, homing missiles or laser drones, your job isn't ducking every single hit, but outperforming the enemy in total. And yeah, I acknowledged, you can build a lightweight boost dodge master build, I've seen the vids, but we're speaking generally here. In short, it makes perfect sense the power comes from stat boosts, but then AC6 really obviously plays up the Dark Souls aesthetic, you know, takes clear measures to onboard Dark Souls people to Armored Core because the fan bases are truly incomparably sized. No, you won't be getting a properly invincible dodge roll, sweaty. Here's your Estus packs and your earnable damage mitigation not totally dissimilar to boosting your vitality in a Souls game. Armored Core never did this kind of thing, though it probably should've best you could do was dodge with skillful inputs, equip better parts, use missile interceptors. Some of the really funny stuff in older games is basically inexcusable. Disgusting, annoying, and time-wasting. You do not become a better person playing The Last Raven. So if anyone tells you passive stat builds are a waste of time, push them off a building. And yet, here I am, playing through the Baltius boss fight, post-nerf because I picked it up the day after, Rip. Blasting through whatever this thing is, it's easier than Baltius, so who cares? Dismantling the other unique enemies from that one lava spinning thing to the very silly mobile mind dispensary, all of these boss fights. Thinking, man, you know, that reminds me of Dark Souls. That big giant flame slash, that's basically just Dark Souls, huh? Like that view there, that's just Elden Ring in it. Like with modern buildings, Ibis, huh? like Ibis from Armored Core Silent Line. That's a neat callback. Except it's dripping with red particle effects, dies, gets up again a la Sekiro, and ends up too difficult for my terrible build, forcing me to equip double stun needle, and the boss fight rolls over, and man, so I pull up to the final boss of the bad route, the route you go down if you don't make the right choices, but also the game demands multiple playthroughs to unlock the other endings anyway, but regardless, my build fumbles here as well. This time, I can't outdamage her and she's too fast to handle, also pulling some uh, Souls-like schmooves if you know what I'm saying. So, like in Verdict Day, I get the tankiest build I can, roll her up, and smoke her. What a game. So I'm thinking, at this moment, that maybe Armored Core 
all needs a normal difficulty and a hard difficulty, because for the sake of argument, if the joy is the builds, and some builds are just ass, I want to get to play ass anyway, because it's fun. That's joy, right? I blame part balancing on that quirk and my own skill, and that's adjustable in modern games, so maybe we drop that complaint and move on. But after getting whacked by Ibis and this character, and seeing all the visual callbacks to what Elden Ring and other Souls games were doing, as opposed to whatever the other Armored Core games did, I'm left thinking that FromSoft feels compelled to wink at Dark Souls fans to wrap up their old mainstay IP in the the new hotness's drapery to get sales. And it works. It's visually decadent, absolutely gorgeous, splashing blues and reds across the sky, painting above the barren land below. It's great. But then I see the consumable health packs and the other souls tropes and wonder if Armored Core can ever be itself to be saleable, if FromSoft is moving on. That said, these things are good as well. It feels good to have extra chances or health packs. It feels good shooting your HP back up to full because you had a pack left over. That's tapping directly into the joy of the medium. It feels good to ramrod through the whole game like an unstoppable mock speed icebreaker because f you. Yeah, you gave me so much trouble before. Yeah, f you. It feels distinctly from soft to cast a world in these hues specifically and frame things how they do, regardless of whether it's souls or not. Souls is from, from is Armored Core, Armored Core can arguably be Souls or cop from its cash. For context, because I really don't want to be cynical, FromSoft was such a rock star developer, way beyond just Armored Core. Their games are fascinating. They were the constant B studio, scraping along, making the strangest RPGs, and dipping into plenty of genres. They made cool games. Lost Kingdoms, Atogi, Evergrace, Kuan, ETC, they were the best. But they never made much money doing fun stuff. Once Souls turned into a currency printing press, I'm sure they knew they could breathe, but only if they kept doing the successful thing. In a way, I'm heartbroken that truly innovative expression may very well be dead for the studio, outside of anything new they happen to develop going forward. That everything will need Souls tropes and dressing to get greenlit. And that's the point of all these loose threads, basically. I don't care that I felt compelled into a build. I don't care that all of these parts are sitting in my garage unused. I don't really care that the game has a few difficulty spikes. And I definitely don't mind that the game is trying new things. What I do kind of worry about is that AC is being made to surrender its identity. Hopefully this ages poorly. I love this fear to age poorly. I think From should have been appreciated way back when. I love FromSoft's weird games, and I think people should play them. Not exclusively their top-line modern fare. Armored Core always had an identity crisis, at least in terms of design. It played with itself constantly, pun intended, jerk off pun intended, but that perpetual flexibility made it interesting, textured. While well, layered, we've seen a lot of flavors of mech combat, you know? AC6 is very much the AAA flavor, so like vanilla, I guess, or deep fried ice cream, rich, really an incredible experience, but not something I need a whole lot of. It's great. It's great. Great stuff, really. This title actually does shake things up as far as story is concerned, which well, that never happens. What's up, AC? This particular game takes place in a future where humankind has transcended Earth and inhabits multiple planets. Rubicon 3, on the frontier of known space, houses a super substance called Coral, which both works as a magical fuel source with super turbo power, sure, whatever, and also as a sort of data bank that can, quote, manifest sentient information patterns with comprehensible personalities, like AI. So, Coral people can tell you tales. Obviously, that's difficult for Armored Core 6, a game in a series that refuses to show human faces, which is true of this title as well. So it manifests as a voice in the player character's head, the player, of course, being a raven of dubious origins acting as a mercenary, pulling gigs for various corporations who want control of the resource. One thing you learn very quickly, whether through data logs or just paying attention is that AC6 pays much more attention to world building than previous titles, again potentially owing to Soul's inspiration. Older games had hints and traces, some 
with whole heaps to uncover, but rarely with the spice, with the sci-fi intrigue that Six drizzles itself with. We're talking Coral, now released, threatening to spill out into space, potential catastrophe-level business. The stakes have never been higher. I'm going to spoil events for a contemporary game, so you have three seconds. The voice in your head that occasionally adds commentary about any given situation, mostly about the coral, inhabits an AC and fights you in the default ending, the bad ending, if you fail to sufficiently deviate and fight for yourself, something you can't actually do until playthroughs 2 and 3, a fairly intelligent move from the developer knowing how its fans play these games and pick through these stories, and knowing how quick repeat runs can be. This ending involves repeating a past cataclysm on a larger scale, effectively genociding a planet to quell the coral and presumably failing to meaningfully do so, a la Dark Souls. God, I hate having to say that every five minutes. The second potential ending ends the same, except the player sides with Air, the voice, to help liberate Rubicon. Though you need to team up with old friends and snuff others, the planet is preserved, but the future is uncertain. Coral isn't understood well enough to commentate its viability for human coral coexistence or whatever nonsense the voice pops off with. The final ending involves freeing the coral and spreading it openly throughout the universe. Something something Rubicon Caesar Cross River reference. Anyway, Coral release. As always with Souls-type endings, you'll be left bamboozled about the value until you Google an explainer video so somebody can tell you some things. The game talks about choosing and free will and fighting for yourself and then makes you go along with this all mind character AI jerk-off until the end, and I'm not saying that's weird, I'm just saying I actually do not understand the ending's purpose or value outside of an uncertain future except more serious this time. Coral spreading throughout the universe seems to be a leap for human evolution a merging of two distinct entities into coexistence, or even cohabitation. It's bizarre to wrap your head around and takes Armored Core beyond its traditionally gritty corporate sci-fi beats, but it's still pretty open to interpretation, good or ill. Eh, maybe we'll find out in the DLC. Also, I believe I described in very broad strokes the endings of various FromSoft games in that entry. Okay, good. The story of Armored Core is a story I know very well. Producing the next thing so you can justify producing the next thing. Sometimes it comes off as cynical. Sometimes it's artsy. Sometimes you just spin your wheels and make the same thing eight times because it's what worked before. Sometimes the things you make are appreciated by a very small number of people. And while you're proud of your work, you can only look at the hard numbers and think, wow, I could not have fucked this up harder if I tried. Sometimes you wonder what your place in the bigger sphere of whatever you're making is and have confusing shifts and episodes, peaks, valleys, and plateaus. You try new things, you grow, change, evolve, and not always in the ways people want or expect. And you don't have total control of that. The money people demand it or the times call for it, so you're stuck hammering away at that next thing, praying that this is the one that matters. This is the one that casts my name in shining fucking gold and makes all the hard work and the failures and the flowers you grew that no one ever saw worth their flickering time in the light. And you look up from your flower, very wilted by this point, and some people who've been watching your work put their hands on your shoulder and tell you to keep going because to them, you've always been there, always making things, and they got used to the view. And you do. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Alpha, 42, All Snaps, Arch, Arsewasser, Azura, Axinate, Audra, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bosch 7, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Beguiles, Bing Bing Doo Doo Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Wargle Hargle, Bohop, Boom Dead, BH Operator, Brandon S, Brandon Hesse, Brios, British Gooch, Cow, Pixar, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Blasted, Captain Wade, Sea Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Hero Hero, Cordon, Chris Bromo, CLB 5000, Cody Golden, Comfy Moogle, Couch Mobile. Crash Girls, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Don Dio, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Dakey Stag, Swag, David Bear, Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Deadwood, De Dennis Samaya, Destrega, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doug Prince, Dr. Cullen, PhD, The Protagonist, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Fox, LP 
Castillo, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Empty Tenshi, Eric Monticello, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Tnar, Fail Knight, Forte Noir, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Frog Vormis, Gato Nero, Glyph Seeker, Nine Cat, Dobo Bobo, Goose 6112, Great, the Darkest Black, Go Corey, Gucci Plant, Asi Ibrahim Tanyurga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Demon, Game and Station, Hermit J, Hex Max, Honey Mutt, Horn Tiger, How do you know? Huey, I just took seven grams of magic mushrooms and now I'm lost in the woods. I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Cloud. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated Cherry. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not Why? good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jack Hydra. Jacob. James. Jason Lash. Jaden. J.L. Severus. J. Davis. J.K. Hedgehog. John Poe the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Jorzy Burden. Juicy Frost. Jules DLC. Julian My Julian. Kaiseta Slow. K-Bash's best K? Keegan Too Cool. Keith the Thief. Kata Snap. King Kuma. Keith. Can I pipe? Clock. K. Noe. Kong 2020. Crazy. Crazy. Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Kais. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalia. Lady Weed. Latrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Little Big Trouble. Loathsome Dung Eater. Lord. Low Fat Mogu. Lucas Boy. Lucky McSmucky. Mac James. Lunatic. Lupin the Turd. Magic Meow. Magical Mad Man. Mama Rollin. Metapool. Mara Ganger. Hercules. Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Meeple Puppet. Metal Gear Gashes. Michelle Citrano. Mike DeVille. Mickey Moe Official. Mikusagi. Moa. Bobby Dobby. Big Titty Goff. GF Queen. On a Chrome only. Morgana Black. Modi. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dabface McYoink Bomb. Nyra New. Nito Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rat. Nifty Rex. Norian Daridius. Not Nobel. Nuggy. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Omega Fighter. Omni Nerd Zero. Only LK. The Plant. PBK. Pandemic Cowboy. PK Gaming. Be Mike. Popular for Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Probably not Grady. Fractal and Pals. Project Darklight. Punch Fighter Champion. Quasar McDougal. Quillwork. Quinn. Rad Punk. Raging Ataraxia. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Frame. Relay. Roy Londo. RP Gamer. Ryan Maury Brooks. Psycon Man. Siren Smells Good. Salsa. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. Say Say. Sakai No Awarda. Sephirium. Sexy Bionicle GS. Shot. Shinigami. Shintendo. Shut Up Wesley. Silver Bear 909. Singe. Sir Doodles A Lot. Sim. God! Sleepy Wabbit. Snars. Tozetta Dad. Suckum Bopper. Suckdologer. Space Lizard. Squidget. Squishward. Star Night Sky. Storm Strider and the House of Storm. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Dingus. Super Sandwich Guy. Shorn Chubbington. Terrence Swift. The Big Buddy. The Clown Prince of Cream. The Digital Dutchman. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah. The Green Loki. The Crispy Boy. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Nomad. The Real McCoy. The Dick Mystic. Fresh. Rips Heart. Tiggles McGuffin. Timid the Rider, Turtle Play, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, Vig, Vacant Plaza, Valen Rist, Venom, Vice Pop, Vic, Waposa, Weed Trash, wow, Waylon, Where Am I Help, Widgy, Winter Solstice, Wind TV, Wrenchim, Zanny Tanner, Yayro 12, Yashi Chi, Yay Kunda, Your Mom, Winky Face, Zachary Lives, Zachary Z, Zanasa, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Zalazar, Silvlin Ray, Zenova, Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash